We went to Shrewsbury yesterday with the uh, Bootle Evening Townswomen's Guild. And, uh, oh, the countryside was magnificent. Oh, it was beautiful. It was every shade of green. You couldn't, I didn't know there were so many shades of green. And the little lambs. It seems to me that, uh, that nobody can really afford to run a stately home nowadays. We might as well have some stately cottages. But I go far on that. I say what we need now are not so much stately homes, but stately minds. Stately minds. That's one of my favourite phrases. Really, stately minds. Well, maybe a lot of it is because there's no father. It might be that, and... But still, he's the only one in the family that's ever done it. Well, what was the last lot he did? Was it three pounds you stole and spent it? And, I mean, he's no need to do it. He gets... Uh, he, he goes to the pictures, they get sweets, and they get plenty of fruit, don't you? They kept short of nothing. I got a TV put in for them. There's nothing the more I can give them. I was going on the road one day, just on my old solitary tin pot way, when suddenly round the corner come the flying squad. The usual chatter, they turned round and they said, well, give an account of your movements. I said, I've been to London, Sheffield, Nottingham, Newcastle, Birkenhead, Seacombe, Liverpool, Brighton, Huddersfield, Halifax, Barnsley, Wakefield, Norman and Pontefract. Black Eaton, Dumfries, Falkirk, Dundee, Tran and Dumbarton, Scotland, Merthyr, Tibble, Pontefract, Aberdeer, Cardiff City, Wrexham and Bristley, Wales. He says, hold on a bit, lad, I've had enough. He was puzzled with the detective. This town's a better city today. No, the world. The world just goes on. The mass of people, I don't think they're much interested in anything outside their own lives. I think if I got a job and settle down, get myself tidied up, some nice clothes, I think my wife would have me back tomorrow. I was talking to a fellow the other week. He'd just come from Africa. He'd been away on a ship. And he tells me that there was over six million huts to let in Africa. There's that many Africans over here. He said, I've dreamed about going to New Zealand, he said, I'm going. And I've called him for everything. I said, I'd never speak to him again. Simply because, like with Alf, my hubby be, being so ill, and he, the, the boy was his sun, moon and stars. But I'm proud of him now. 
And, if, and I say, if anybody emigrates, it takes guts to do it. And that's why I wouldn't go to New Zealand, because I don't think I've got the guts to do it. <laughs> Why should a man work when he has the health and strength to lie in bed? about an accident at Kilburn, London, last Thursday night, when an elderly woman was knocked down by a car and received fatal injuries. yet. You knew you was late when I shouted you this morning. I've always slept a bit myself. Now look, it's quarter to eight by the right time. That clock's not fast this morning, you know. Oh, Bernard, come on, son, hurry up. You know you've about quarter an hour's walk to school. Johnny, do you want any more before you go? Sure. And if that man found three of us in that bed, my mother was brought to the court and fined five shillings. And you'd, okay. have to, you'd have to go out in the backyard in, in the shivering cold and sit in the lavatory till he went. The good old days. It was no good old days. But kissed. I fully think myself that education is the finest thing that ever a man could have. 
I've often said it, his brains and my talent could go a wrong way, if you follow me, mainly. Take her by the water, give her a kiss and make her cry. She's the old man's daughter. He's going to bare feet like I went over the snow. It's a better world than it was. I'm sure of that. On a Christmas morning, there was a van used to come round. They used to call it Father Christmas. I don't know the Methodists or Wesleyans. I can't tell you which. It belonged to uh, Central Hall. I think they were Quakers or something. They used to come round on a Christmas morning with a van and they'd give each little child a little underwear and a little penny and a doll. And that's all them children ever got. There was no Santa Claus, no, no stockings. You don't think I can live on the dole at two pound a week, do you? And pay a big fat Irish landlady three pound ten board and lodge? Where's me beer money and cigarette money coming from? Where's my harem? I think we'll be all standing on the corner again before long, woman a fag. No electric light whatever. And the town hall tell me I must pay for it myself. My chimney stack was demolished on the 5th of November, 1957. I've got cats here. I've got two cats, a big one and a kitten. The big ones run out with flies and left me with the little ones, and that's no good. 
big one won't stay. It goes out. Even the cats are afraid to stay in the bloody house, and yet we've got to stay here. And the cockroaches, well, till lately, they've been eating us alive. To go to the next door but one, and look up to the roof, and is there a big manhole in the roof where they've got to go for the policeman the other night to get the little baby out, because the ceiling was falling on and killing it. Do you see that cat? Well, the damn lads done that to his ear. Only yesterday, the roof, it steamed in and steamed in. I'm just weary and fed up with it. There's just me and my sister, two on her own. I'm 61 and she's 57. And I think it's downright shame that we should live under these conditions. I asked him like about a job and uh, they were draining and that with pipes and that, you know, taking the sewage up. He says, what can you do? I says, night watching. He says, can you wheel a barrel? I said, yes. He says, can you go back to the mixer and use a shovel? I said, I think I can. And he told me, he says, what are you betrayed? I said, I'm a labourer. So after he'd weighed me up from top to toe, Mr Finnegan turned around, he said, oh, he says, as much as I admire your pluck, he says, you're too light for every work and you're too heavy for light work. I said, I'm neither use nor ornament, so I walked out there. Now, that's one of my uh, best pastimes of the public library. Get in there and see the old cronies, the one-time empire builders, trying to do the same as me live on uh, less than three pound a week. Now, I must speak the truth, I wasn't satisfied with my condition in life. I wasn't satisfied with my own class, really. I wanted to be in a class a little higher intellectually. The class I belong is the uh, higher working class. The lower working class, well, they are the animal class, actually, absolutely. They can talk on nothing. They are absolutely illiterate. Drink, drink, drink.
members of the cabinet, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Liberal Party, and the Lord Chancellor and the Speaker, the High Commissioners, the representatives of the services. They stand before the Cenotaph. And we await the notes of Big Ben to announce the silence. I'd gone to work on the Tuesday morning and a big envelope came. So I opened this envelope, which I shouldn't have done, but I did do. And it was his papers to report to Ashton Underline. So I said to the oldest son, I said, don't go to school this morning. I said, Joe, you better take this letter down. Oh, he says, I'm not missing school. I said, you'll do as you were told. You'll take this letter down to the warehouse. Then ask for your father. So he went. So he come back. I said, how did he go on? Oh, he said, uh, it's his mobilisation papers. My dad is going away to the war. He says he'll be home soon, but he didn't come home soon. They all landed into Tommy Duck's round the corner. So anyhow, I'll tell you about uh, half past one. No, oh, they rolled in six of them with a great big gallon jar of beer drunk. So of course, I didn't know the taste of drink. And I says, oh, you've come home in a nice state, I said. So one of them said, oh, well, there, man, ma. He says, we'll uh, not see you for a long time after, he said. Well, anyhow, I tell you, they, he had a few hours sleep and they all went home. And at night time, they come again and they adjourned to a singing room here. So I said, oh, don't go out and get any more drink. I said, you've had enough today. You know, very well, you've got to go away tonight. Oh, he says, we'll get there some road or other. Well, anyhow, they went. And they took bottles of beer with them to the station. And he said, now, Mary, he said, if you have a little girl, call it Margaret. And if it's a little boy, call it Stephen. I said, all right. So he kissed us and he went away and we never seen him after he was killed at... I got notice to say he'd been killed. It was a four days back, but he was killed, it seems, on the 12th March, New Chapelle. So they are... Uh... The wind stirs the leaves and, and the flags of the cenotaph as slowly these tributes grow at the very foot of the cenotaph. There are many wreaths to be laid this morning. So Madge said to me she thought that the budgie was egg-bound. And I said, well, we'll have to do something about it because it'll die if we don't. I said, have you got a book on budgie? She said, no. So she sent the boy out to buy a book and we did what we could for it. So she rang me up the next day, told me there was no eggs, rang me up the next day, no eggs. So I said to her, well, you, you better take it to the university and have it seen to there. So she said, oh, I can't do that. She said, it says in the budgie book, You've got to keep them in the one heat. If I take it out in the cold, it'll get pneumonia and die. So anyway, she got a vet in to have a look at it. And Shep, the dog, followed her in. And uh, he goes to the cage to get the budgie out. Opens the cage, the budgie flies out, alights on the mat, the dog jumps on it, and no budgie. He picks it up, the vet, looks at it, he said, this budgie's not egg-bound. He said, it's got a tumour. And with that, he just threw it in the fire. So Madge says, good heavens, she says, my lads will go mad. What did you do that for? He said, well, cremation is the most hygienic thing, madam. That will be seven and six. <laughs> <laughs> Get the flavours in here, Barry. Get something nurtured it at times with that thing when he's chewing and going on with his stuff. It's him being a good boy. I was just telling you, over this day, a new job I'd been after, you see. And uh, she asked me what I do with the carpets for. So I told her I didn't want to do the carpets. I'd already done the big one in the parlour. She didn't say to me she didn't want any carpets. Well, she wanted to know, really, what was the reason I'd left me other place for. So, of course, I told her it was over the carpets. <laughs> The landlord came up, you see, the other day, and he said to me, is your sister still living with you? I said, yes, I said, you can't put that in the So I started to speak to her, and I said, um, I suppose you're wondering why I'm uh, reading my Bible in here. She said, well, it, it did seem a bit... Uh... Yeah. You won't carry the can back, but I've got to carry the can back. 
but I'm not carrying the can back for no... Talk, talk, know? talk. I love to listen to it. Go round in the mornings, down the street, yup, yup, yup. People say to me, big-hearted fear. You won't carry the can back, I've but I've got to the can back. But I'm not carrying the can back for no... Talk, the talk, talk. The landlord came up, you I'll see, I'll love the to listen day, to it. <laughs> The old attitude of everybody as you were finished. You were too old. Go, go, go. I would have liked to have worked down, but that threw me out. <laughs> because I was old. It's a sin to grow old, you know. We had an old lady here, and um, she, everybody would run and get her a cup of tea, and they'd wait on her and do all those little things, but she'd always say, Nobody wants me. Well, I mean, if you take that attitude, you can't expect anyone to want you, can you? I could take a pound out this morning, lay it out, and I wouldn't see anything for it. Look at the price of your butter. Why, we got the best butter when I was a girl at eightpence a pound, and the best roll of bacon at sixpence. Twenty-four eggs for a shilling. Uh, two pounds of sugar. A pound of margarine. And I think I'll take a pound of cooking fat. I'm a bit short. How long have people been having good material things? How long? They haven't had it above, what, 20, 30 years. This release from sheer anxiety about where the next meal was coming from. If, when the pressure is lifted, they should go a bit daft for 10 minutes, who's to blame? And who's to wonder at it? in a bathination and water. Dead and wounded were lying about. And as I lay there, a voice alongside me said, Look, Murphy, there's a little buttercup. I said, Well, what about it? But that must be the good seed, fallen on the good ground. We must be the bad seed, fallen on the rocks. And my dad used to go away to sea, like, and it's very hard on my mother, you know. We used to give her beatings for nothing. She was a very hard-working woman. And um, when he come home from sea, all the money would go over the county. And then, of course, my mother died on Christmas Eve. And she left me 14. A little baby, 12 months old. And another one, now, uh, four. My dad stayed with us eight weeks. And then he got a ship and went away and left us. So he, of course, he died after, you know. Then I had more trouble on my plate, like my husband never ever got much work. And I've had to work all my life. But thank God, God's been very good to me and his holy mother. It's a bit of a lousy life, taking it all around from top to toe. I was a big baby, and I was a fat little girl, a fat school girl. 
a fat young woman, and now I'm a fat old woman. <laughs> Happy days. We're all part of, of a great mass. This great mass is just split up into little bits. We're the little bits. I'm part of you, you're part of me. The agony of our time is this overhanging threat. What can you say about that? The overhanging threat to the atomic bomb.